Well, my name is Morgan Stockton. I'm a glassworks artist based in Leicester. Alongside my creative practice, I also work as gallery education and marketing coordinator at Leicester Gallery. And I manage their learning program, social media and marketing. Um, I first started working with glass at university. So I studied design crafts at De Montfort University in Leicester. Um, but I feel like the real zest for my work really began in my final year. Before that, I'd begun to feel a bit lost with glass making because everything was very functional that I was doing. And, um, and there's quite a lot of pressure on your final collection to be, you know, the, the thing that represents you as you go out into the world after graduating. Um, so I reflected a lot on previous projects that I did, but um, became really inspired by the architecture of my hometown, which is Birmingham in the UK. And, um, focused really on brutalism in Birmingham, which was an architectural style which emerged in the 1950s here as part of the reconstruction projects uh, for the post-war era. And I started to become really fascinated with how do I translate um, this into glass and these standard building materials like steel and glass and concrete. So I just tried loads of combinations of metal and glass first. Uh, and lo loads of them didn't work because they're not compatible. So things would disintegrate or crack or fracture and it just wasn't working until I did this one perfect one where, you know, it wasn't perfect by any means of the word really, but it didn't disintegrate, it didn't crack and it just created this beautiful surface texture. And that's when I really got hooked by the process of using these two materials together. So what techniques do you work with? You said you incorporate two materials together. Which are they and what is the outcome? Um, I mostly use cage blowing uh, techniques, but also mold blowing and slumping, depending on if I'm blowing into a cage or onto the metal. Um, my latest project is called Tensions, and it's an ever evolving body of work that explores the materiality of glass and steel and the tensions that are created by both of their incompatibilities together. It's basically a series of what ifs. So I just create these wire molds that we blow into and then um, I never really know what the outcome is gonna be, even if I try and replicate something that I thought worked really well. And I think that kind of spontaneity is really important for me of not knowing what the outcome is going to be, uh, but it's a huge driving force for what I make next. So um, I reflect on each piece and learn and grow from it. and it informs the next one I make. Um, and the steel wires become really important in my work as before, it was just a tool that I was using and I was taking it off the glass. So, um, I don't know. so it's like a little bit like, like this. And then I'd take the wire off and it'd create these beautiful surface patterns. And then I'd be left with almost like this skeletal line drawing form and wire of what the vessel looked like. But now they've become um, a much more integral part of the pieces. So they look more like this. And I leave the wire on to create these billowing uh, wiry shapes. <laughs> I'm just really trying to push the boundaries of how both the materials um, work. <laughs> and what are the main challenges, would you say, in combining those two seeming, seemingly incompatible materials, steel and glass? Well, there's quite a few challenges of working with materials that don't really like each other. Um, they don't, people often ask me if they're stuck to each other, and they're not. It, the way that the glass and the wire merge together is because the the glass blows through the, the squares in the cage grid and it kind of creates this interlocking of glass that's pushed through beyond the wire and that kind of keeps it in place. Um, but they, they just push and pull at each other and it often looks like the glass is breathing really heavy inhales and exhales as these materials headbutt against each other. It's really interesting to actually watch um, the glass try to move through it but the way that I construct the wire it's all, they're almost like locked so as the glass is um, expanding to try and go through it it's actually tightening the wires grip around it which suffocates it even more um, but yeah there, there are often problems like there are different cavities within the wires you can probably see where things have blown through at different rates so things can sides can blow a bit thin and then some parts cool down too fast and there's 
the most frustrating part of them is there's no final reheat after they've been blown into the wire. So that part of time from when it comes out the glory hole to into the wire cage and then into the lear is very precious and we have to work very quickly because you can't give it a quick flash before it goes into the lear. So the temperature of it drops very quickly and it might crack. Um, but I think that's part of the fun. <laughs> and then the larger they are, the less time we seem to have because they, I've had, oh, I've had problems where the lear isn't quite big enough for the wire to go in because they're not made in these perfectly square chunks they're you know they've got bits coming out of everywhere <laughs> so when you're trying to put them in you might have I might have measured it and think this this will fit in and then it doesn't and then next thing you know we're trying to kick it off the pipe into the lid it's quite dramatic <laughs> and what are the, what is the main source of inspiration for your designs um my source of inspiration has always been Birmingham's architectural industrial heritage but more recently, after I graduated in 2018, I actually found out that my great great grandfather, Samuel Saunders, was a glassblower at Chance Brothers Glassworks in Smethwick, which is in Birmingham in the UK. And then his wife, I found out later, also worked in the office there. And their son, um, who would have been named after if I was a boy, uh, was part of their transport team. And then on my nan's other side, her other granddad worked as a mechanic for Chance and his wife owned the shop that was on site. And my nan has all these wonderful memories of um, people playing cards in her shop after hours. And she'd arrange the cigarette packets in the window into these boat forms. <laughs> so people would come in and buy their cigarettes there. And uh, she'd go to all the Chance Christmas parties. And she remembers seeing the huge room of Cullet through a broken window when they'd go and play up on the train tracks that ran through the site and she's just got these wonderful memories and she lived in that area for over 40 years she you know spent her whole life there um and I felt like I really knew the area very well until I started going to archives and learning more about Smethwick and kind of how my heritage is really intrinsically linked to Chance and I wouldn't even say this was in a unique story because at the time Chance had thousands of employees over those years which was a really it was a huge cornerstone of Birmingham's industrial manufacturing heritage. But unfortunately, their site closed in the 80s and it's now derelict and they're planning to turn it all but the one uh, grade listed building into houses. Um, so over the past few years, I've really realised the power in storytelling and passing down stories from generation to generation so things aren't lost. And that is more important than ever to keep telling those stories and how I intertwine them into the work that I make. That's so interesting that it actually turned out that it's in your blood. Yeah, yeah, and I just had no idea. I remember, it's actually, the, it's quite a mundane story of how I found out. My mum was doing that kind of embarrassing mom thing where she was showing my work on Facebook. And one of my great aunts uh, commented on it like, oh, does Morgan know that her great granddad used to be a glass blower and you know it used to get so hot in there that the pub next door would bring them beer to drink while they were working <laughs> and I just remember thinking like wow that's a health and safety nightmare isn't it everybody's having a bed when <laughs> this working with molten glass <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> yeah, I guess it is <laughs> and what is your workplace like you showed us some works could you tell us more about them so my workplace kind of differs as uh, I hire out spaces to actually blow glass around the Midlands of um, the UK. But I mainly make work from home. I was going to get a studio just before um, the lockdown happened in last March now, and it kind of fell through as I didn't want to be getting public transport to go to the other side of town to go to the studio. But I have always kind of lived with my work and there is so much problem solving that um, happens within my work now especially with the tensions pieces because I never know how they're going to turn out so then once they're blown I then have to start thinking about how they're going to be cold worked and most of the time the necklines are really like inside the wire so I'm thinking about how do I peel back some of the wire to get to the neck of the piece or should I just leave it or should I cut parts away and I don't think that I'd be able to figure that out if I wasn't actually just 
subconsciously being around them every day and unlocking those possibilities. I don't think I could have dreamt of those solutions if they were far away in a studio somewhere. <laughs> So since you were a participant in 2019 and we're currently accepting applications for this year's edition of the Biennale, could you tell us why you joined IBG Bulgaria and what was your experience? Uh, I loved it. So I joined IBG Bulgaria at the time because I'd recently graduated and um, I was finding it difficult not making all the time. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect how expensive studios were to hire or finding the resources, like the certain types of greys that I use because one of them went out of stock for a really, really long time here. And it was basically like gold dust trying to get your hands on it. And so I dedicated that time to just getting my work out there for the work that I already had and trying to promote myself in the best way that I could. And I thought we're better than one of the largest and most dedicated glass exhibitions. <laughs> um, but it was wonderful and I love being part of it because um, it felt like I was a part of something that was much bigger than myself and um, yeah it just created a real sense of glass community and I'm part of the Contemporary Glass Society and that's how I found out about the, the opportunity. <laughs> and lastly in your opinion why is it important to introduce the public to contemporary glass art both generally and in Bulgaria specifically? So I think um, whilst glass blowing isn't on the Heritage Crafts Association's endangered list, in the UK specifically, courses and opportunities to learn the craft are being cut left, right and centre. There are really only a handful of universities left where you can study and train in glass blowing, and it's getting harder and harder with university cuts to, to try and find spaces and the opportunities to do that. Um, but I think with the popularity of uh blown away uh, hopefully you know that's having a massive impact on the public perception of glass blowing which is just incredible really i've had friends and family reach out to me and be like goodness i didn't know it was like that or it looks so dangerous or um you know and it's really opened their eyes and ignite more curiosity about it, which i think in turn will introduce newer and larger audiences to glass exhibitions like ibg bulgaria hopefully Thank you. Thank you very much for this interview, for the conversation and the sharing your experience. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to, well, I'm in the, the process of applying for the next IBG Bulgaria too now. <laughs>